Yeah, Linda Hudgens told me I wasn't allowed to take off another week if it meant I was coming back with 39 <laughs> pages of lesson. Sorry. But I do believe that this may stretch us for two weeks. So hold on to it. It may last for next week. Um, uh, in the library, we've set up a lecture in April of next year, April of 2013, with Don Carson, D.A. Carson. And he's a well-known New Testament scholar. And in the process of, of trying to talk him into coming, I kind of did some background work on him to see what things he likes, what things he doesn't like. And I came across an interview where R.C. Sproul was interviewing Don Carson. And R.C. Sproul said, who, who himself is no uh, stranger to biblical studies, um, Dr. Sproul said uh, uh, to Dan Carson, what is the, the set of tools that you think as students we need to have to better understand Scripture? Now, Dr. Carson's response was uh, to address the language in Scripture, remembering that Scripture was written mainly in Hebrew and Greek, but with significant passages in Aramaic and a Latin phrase. And so uh, um, uh, Don Carson said language is important because language translation, even today, is not as simple as one word into another. The example that Don Carson gave, who I might add grew up in, in French Canada, and so he's fluent not just in his biblical languages, but he's fluent in French as well as English. Uh, Don Carson said that the French language has no direct word, just one word, for home. Now, I don't speak French, so I don't know if that's true or not, but he seemed a reasonable fella, and when he started talking about how impossible it is to translate home, home on the range, directly into French, it made sense to me. What I was doing, though, is I was thinking in terms of the languages that I know, specifically the biblical languages, which is what he was prompting people to learn or at least become familiar with. And I thought, you know, it is important to know Greek. It is important to know Hebrew. It is important to know these things, but not for salvation purposes. The gospel is presented so clearly and so simply in Scripture, that a child can understand it. The core message of Jesus Christ dying for our sins, resurrected into a new life with the promise that as we put our trust or faith in Him, His righteousness is counted as our righteousness. That's not a hard thing to understand. Now that doesn't mean that we as Christians should be satisfied with simply understanding that. I can remember when I was in high school and I first came across the passage in the book of Hebrews where the writer says, I could continue to feed you milk like a baby. In fact, I kind of need to, but you shouldn't need milk at this point. You should be ready for meat. Is that Hebrews or was that Paul and to the Corinthians? Either way, it's in there. Um, and, and I remember working through that and thinking, I don't want to live my life on baby formula. And what we've got is an opportunity, especially in today's age, with the many tools that are available, is we've got an opportunity to dig into Scripture in greater depth which is what we're trying to do here in part through this Old Testament survey that we're, we're coming to a close. Well, if we're going to address the language, you don't need to just know the Hebrew words. You don't just need to know the Greek words because the language includes mindset and culture. The language words aren't simply words that translate one to the other. You need to get into the mindset behind those words. You need to understand the culture behind them. If I were to tell you 7-Up, uh, uh, well, if I put a logo up there, you might know I'm talking about what I'm going to drink with my lunch. But if I don't have the logo up there, you might think 7-Up was a reference to the score in the racquetball game that Lewis and I had. It was 7-Up. Or the football score, 7-Up. 
words take on a special meaning within cultures. And that's some of what we've got to look at as we read more of Daniel. We're not just going straight into Daniel chapter 7, the vision chapter today. If you're following along in that introduction or in that uh, handout, we're going to go through some of it, but we're rapidly going to shift to the appendix. Because there are tools that we need in our toolkit if we're going to do the work that needs to be done in understanding Daniel, and not just Daniel, but some other parts of the Bible that are extremely hard to understand. So I want us to address the language. And some of this is, is a, a, a tool of biblical study that would have uh, perhaps helped Galileo Galilei in his day. Galileo Galilei existed at a time in the late 15, early 1600s when science was in a real quandary. Science was trying to figure out, is the sun the center of our, uh, they thought universe, we'll say solar system, but is the sun the center and the earth rotates around the sun or is the earth the center, and the sun rotates around the earth. That was the debate. Big debate in the scientific community, not just in the church. The Pope was actually one of Galileo's uh, um, supporters in this, initially, because Galileo got called in for writing that the sun was, was the center and the earth rotated around the sun. Galileo thought that explained the tides. He, he, he had compelling data, he thought, to substantiate his point of view. So he gets pulled into the church and called up on heresy. Why? Because of passages in the Bible like this. Psalm 93. The world, the earth, is established. It shall never be moved. How can you, Galileo, Galileo, how can you say the earth is moving around the sun? The psalm says it doesn't ever move. Or Psalm 104. The God set the earth on its foundations. The sun knows its time for setting. So the earth is on foundations, pillars or something. And it's the, earth, the sun that's doing its setting. Or the Ecclesiastes passage that was used against Galileo. The sun rises. The sun goes down and then hustles itself back over to the place where it can rise again. Now these passages were used and, and Galileo had the support of the Pope initially. And there was an agreement worked out on what he would or wouldn't say. He goes back home, but then in the best, uh, he writes a book. And in the book, in the introduction, he quotes the people who believe that the earth is stable. And he quotes them in the character Simplicio. Uh, that's kind of Latin for simpleton. And just happened to put some of the questions of the Pope into simpleton's mouth. He lost his friend, the Pope, at that point. Inquisition pulls him up in 1633, sentences him to house arrest uh, for the rest of his days. So Galileo has that trouble. He has that trouble within the church. It was politics and science as much as it was Scripture, though. But what do you do with that? What do we do with that? Well, one set of people will just say, well, the Bible is ignorant on those things. But certainly we don't think God, who made heaven and earth, would be ignorant. What we do know, though, is God has spoken in history. So God has communicated to a people, and we see the fruit of that communication. We are looking back in time, back in culture, back in language, to see what God was saying to those people knowing that God was saying it for the church and all time to benefit from it, but only within its context. 
And that's not only the context of the verse in the paragraph, in the chapter, or the whole context of Scripture, but it's the context of how people were thinking and understanding what was being said. It is something that is called, um, uh, let's see, a language of appearance is the easiest way to say it. But we could also call it, and the theological term is the phenomenological language, which just comes from the Greek of language of appearance. In other words, there are passages in the Bible that are clearly talking about what you see, what appears to be there, and how it appears to be. The passage like Ecclesiastes 1.5, the sun rises, the sun goes down, hastens to the place where it rises, that's a poetic expression of the cycles of time. And it's a language of appearance. We do the same thing today. I love a beautiful sunset. But don't, if I tell you that, say, well, that Lubbock Independent School District obviously produced a bunch of scientific imbeciles. Lanier thinks the sun sets. It doesn't. It stayed in the same place. It's the earth that was rotating. No, we call it that because that's what it appears to be. That's our terminology. We're not making a scientific pronouncement there. We're just saying what appears to be. Now here's the warning. Twofold warning. When you're studying Scripture in this way which is a good and legitimate and proper way to study it. Warning number one, you got a lot of homework. Because it takes a lot of study and a lot of work to try and understand the time and culture. One of the books that I brought this morning for show and tell is volume one, The Context of Scripture, Canonical Compositions from the Biblical World. This is uh, 599 pages of contemporary writings to the Old Testament from the cultures and the people around Israel and Judah. And I say volume one because this is in a three-volume set, and all of the works out there haven't even been translated yet. We have thousands and tens of thousands of tablets that no one's yet been able to translate or had the time or opportunity. So there's a wealth of knowledge out there, and much of what is in the number part of our lesson today, the appendix, I, I just I had two weeks off, so I took volumes one, two, and three, and I just read them and took a little notepad and just made my notes. There's homework involved. But I want to give you another thing aside from the homework. A second warning is we have a really, really difficult time as humans. The best of us, which I guess I should exclude myself in, the best of y'all. I'll be the worst of us, so I've really got the problem. But I mean the best of us have a tendency not to do what we should do when we study Scripture. When we study Scripture, we're supposed to read from the Scripture and let the Scripture inform our understanding. But our tendency is going to be to read into Scripture what we want Scripture to say. And so we've got this struggle that goes on in our brain, and not just in our brain, but in our heart, by the way, another non-scientific, phenomenological expression of sorts, when we talk about speaking from the heart, that four-chambered muscle going kaboom, 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 and moving the blood through your body is not really processing anything at all. That's just the expression we use. Same type deal. So... What we need to do is we really need to not just do our homework, but we need to do it with a serious uh, uh, willingness to try and determine what Scripture is saying to us as opposed to what we want it to say to us. Um, now, 
is there a slippery slope here? I was talking to one gentleman recently, and he says, well, once you get on the Galileo slope, who's to say Jesus was resurrected? Which means you've got one of two choices. Either you think the sun rotates around the earth, or you think there are mistakes in the Bible. And I don't buy either of those. But it's not a slippery slope that leads me to, oh, then Jesus wasn't resurrected. Of course he was. You can't honestly read Scripture and think that Scripture is teaching there wasn't a physical resurrection or that it was merely the language of appearance. Put your hand in my side. Paul say he appeared to over 500 people and it was physical. And if Jesus wasn't physically resurrected, and this was Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus wasn't resurrected, then eat, drink, and be merry because nothing matters. But Paul's willing to give his life absolutely convinced that Jesus Christ was physically resurrected. Gave up a cushy, cushy life as a leader of Judaism to get on the bad end of the whipping stick. And not just Paul, but countless martyrs. So this is not, uh, the slope is only as slippery as our heart or our poor scholarship. Now, if we do shoddy scholarship, oh, we might be able to, to find all sorts of slippery slope problems. But if your scholarship is solid, the truth, the Word of God is solid. It can stand up to legitimate, honest examination. I'm more convinced of that after 51 years on this earth than I've ever been before. Put heart in there, though, because sometimes our heart wants to read something different in Scripture. Sometimes we think, well, God can't be the God that's portrayed in Scripture. That surely is not God. God needs to be what I want Him to be. I certainly have a better understanding of what God is and who God is than Paul. See, we've got to be real careful because the heart will send us down that slope and then we'll start reading into it what we need to be letting read to us. Does that make sense? All right, so all of this is point one if we were organizing the, the lesson today. Bible study. Core basic principles of Bible study. Now, part two of the lesson, we want to do this to Daniel. By the way, Weston Fields sent us uh, that photograph to use in class. That is a 50 uh, uh, A.D. copy of Daniel, parts of Daniel chapter 2 that were discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There are also parts of Daniel that were discovered that were written in the mid to late 2nd century B.C., a real stumbling block for those who say Daniel was written late. Because a lot of the skeptical scholars that don't want to see God's prophetic hand truly telling the future want to say, Daniel could not have been written before these events. It's just too clear. It must have been written afterwards. And they'll place it around 150 B.C. Which makes it strange that a community in Qumran that's rebelling against all of the normal Judaism, and that's why they've withdrawn, accepted as canonical scripture within 10 to 20 years of when it was supposedly written the first time by some creative genius. But that's a different point. So we want to do this. We want to address Daniel, but I really don't have... This is a survey class, so we can't do more than grab one chapter and really dig into it tight. It's important to do that, though, because of what type of literature these visions in Daniel are. Chapter 7 of Daniel forms the basis of the beast vision in Revelation 
13 and 17. You want to know about the beast of Revelation? You got to start reading in Daniel. So much of Daniel is like the book of Revelation. The language, the mindset, the culture was very different in that day and age than it is ours. We can read something and we can translate it, but we don't get the full gist of it if we don't understand some of the culture behind it. You're with me. That makes sense, right? Okay, if you're with me, then I want to do that in just one important segment, not just of Daniel, but of all of the biblical studies that we do in here. I want to talk about numbers. I, I want to talk about the difference between the way we see numbers and the way they did biblically. That's the appendix to your lesson. We live in a number age. We live in an age where um, numbers are very important. They make a difference. Dr. Bob and I were taking a deposition of a pharmaceutical executive at a drug company. He was the president of the company. And this was a company where there was an issue of whether or not this drug caused heart problems. And the investment community wanted to know because if the drug causes heart problems, it would affect the bottom line of the drug company. So the drug company did this small little study. It was a low back study to see whether or not this drug caused any extra heart problems. They compared the drug to a placebo. It's a sugar pill, except it's not made out of sugar. <laughs> but that's what we know it as. Excuse the lack of scientific. I'm speaking in cultural language, as I call it, a sugar pill. It's a placebo. Turns out there were six times more heart problems with the drug than on the placebo. But the president of the company, when he addressed the investment bankers, told them, I know you're worried about whether our drug causes heart problems. We did this low back study, and it turns out there are the same number of problems on the placebo as our drug. There's no difference. So rest assured. Now I'm taking the deposition. This is sworn testimony. Cameras, video cameras, court reporters, room full of lawyers. More lawyers than, than God should allow to live on earth at one time. <laughs> Which is what, one? No. Uh, so a room full of lawyers. And I said to the man, I said, you didn't tell the truth to the investment community, did you? He says, I think I did. And I said, look, and I pulled it out. Here's the study. You said the number of events were the same. In fact, there were six events on your drug and one on the placebo. You, were, you, you didn't tell him the truth, did you? And his response to me, under the glare of the lights and the camera with the beads of perspiration forming on his head and sweating through his suit, said, in the world where I live, there's no difference between the number six and the number one. I thought, I would like to be in your world for a minute. So I pulled out my wallet and I said, I am so excited to meet you. And I pulled out a dollar bill and I slapped it on the table in front of him and I said, would you give me six? <laughs> and he said, what? I said, I'm going to give you a dollar, you're going to give me six. And we're going to keep doing this until you finally decide there's a difference between six and one and you come back to my world. Except for him, we live in a very number-sensible culture. We have credit card numbers. We have ATM card numbers. We have numerical passwords to get into the ATM machine. We have social security or government identification numbers. We have to know numbers because we use coins. And they're based on numbers. Five pennies to a nickel, two nickels to a dime, two dimes and a half to a quarter. You want to cook? You better know numbers. Not only for the measurements of the ingredients, but where you turn the stove. There's a difference between turning it to 375 and turning it to 150. You want to drive? 
You've got a driver's license number. Not only that, you've got numbers on the road. And those numbers are very specific. 28 years I've practiced law. I've never heard anybody in traffic court say, well, your honor, I know it said speed limit 70. I thought that was a symbolic number for drive whatever I would like. <laughs> and these are specific numbers. They have specific meanings. This is the culture we live in. But if we go into the time box, that's for Doctor Who fans. A lot of you don't know that that is a time box. If we go into the time machine and we go back to the culture of Babylon, back to the time when Daniel's writing this, they didn't have numbers like that. Coinage was just getting started. Most of the, the dealings were by bartering. You didn't pay your tithe in money. You paid your tithe by a tenth of whatever you had, be it produce or be it uh, 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 animals. What, whatever you had, that's what your tenth was. They didn't have speed limits. They didn't have math class. They didn't have remedial math class for most. Numbers were not something where they were trying to figure out the quadratic formula so that they could pass high school algebra. Now that's not to say numbers weren't important. Lest one guy with one sheep want to trade it for the guy with six who didn't think there was a difference between the two. But numbers had almost a mysterious quality to them as well because they didn't understand the world the way we understand it. They didn't have our scientific understanding. So the two groups that really got a hold of numbers were priests and builders. Builders needed to know how to make a building square so it would stand up. Priests used numbers not only in the sacrifices of the system, but priests use numbers because of music. And so the, the, the numerical historians will chart to the fact that it, were, it was notes of the scale and music and the way they would reproduce on the strings of a lyre. And things of this nature that really got the priests. The priests were the ones who would stare at the stars and devise the constellations. Do you think it's any um, um, coincidence that the Big Dipper, the Big Bear, and the Little Dipper, the Little Bear, each have seven stars in them? Because the priests who are looking at the constellations are drawing them up. They're figuring them out. And they're doing the math work to determine, because it's the priests who determine when the moons are. And that the moon comes in four seven-day stages. It's the priests who paid attention to the days of the week, to the New Year's festivals. It's the priests who were tuned into numbers, along with the builders. Now, when we look at their use of numbers, sometimes a number is a number. It just is. Sometimes the number is a symbol. It represents an idea not the physical true number. And sometimes the number's both. Sometimes numbers are used because it's the real number in our sense of the word, but it's also used with a symbolic understanding. And I'll persuade you, I hope, that this is true not just in the Babylonian culture, but this is true in the Bible as well. Sometimes the numbers, they're just simply numbers. It's the accurate 21st century proper number. Sometimes that number is a symbol. And we know enough to know that it's not there because it's the accurate number. It is the symbol of the number. And sometimes that, in fact, most times in the Bible, the number is both. So let's look at that for a moment. And let's start, say with the number three. Now what I've done is I've pulled out four numbers and the appendix that I've given you that deals with these numbers we're going to add to because you really can't understand Revelation without it. The 144,000 things of this nature. But let's look for example at the number three. 
And I've got a few different things in here that uh, uh, the number three that I would like to show you. This gives you a flavor. Now the number three is a number that's considered by, by the scholars. And, and that I would agree. The symbol of three. Three may just mean one, two, three. Okay. But the symbolism behind that, the, 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 the cultural mindset when people saw that number three was that there was something sacred about it and yet something well-rounded. It's like the full sacredness. You can remember that easily because the Trinity is the full sacredness of God. But it's not simply the Trinity. When you go back through your Old Testament, you'll see repeatedly three used as this well-rounded, sacred total. Look, for example, at Isaiah chapter 6. This is the throne room scene. When Isaiah is in front of God's throne, and the angels are calling out, and when the angels call out, they don't say, holy is the Lord of hosts. They say, holy, holy, holy. It's threefold repetition. Now, the people understood this. Jeremiah is talking to the people of his day. When he's telling them, don't think your words alone are going to get you anywhere, even though you do it with the perfect little formula. Look at the evil in the land in Jeremiah 7. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds and I'll let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in these deceptive words. And what are the words? This is the temple of Yahweh, the temple of Yahweh, the temple of Yahweh. See, they say it three times, thinking, okay, we've now covered all of our well-rounded sacred bases. We've done it that three. Symbolically, we have just really spoken in God's language. Exodus. Repeatedly, you have passages like this. Three, this is God telling Moses, three times in the year you'll keep a feast to me. Feast of unleavened bread... Feast of harvest of the first fruits and the feast of ingathering. Three times in the year shall all your males appear before the, God, the Lord God. Three times. That is your sacred, well rounded, total duty. Appear before God three times. Daniel gets thrown into the lion's den. Why? Because he's praying when he shouldn't. What was his habit? He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. Does that mean he was only doing it three times? I suspect not. I suspect he was living a life of prayer. But three times he would in a symbolic manner of recognizing God and the devotion and the sacredness of what he was doing. When God judges David and Israel for the census that they conducted. Do you remember God's judgment on them? He gave David a choice, didn't he? Look at the choice God gives. The Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, and said, You go tell David, you got three choices. And look what the three choices are. Three years of famine... Three months of devastation or three days of pestilence by the sword. That's a three and a three. This was the holiness of God being expressed. When Aaron blesses the people, the famous priestly benediction from number six, one of my favorite passages in the Bible, one of my favorite songs, if you know the song, it's Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious. Yahweh lift up his countenance and give you peace. It's a threefold benediction because it's a benediction of the totality of the sacredness of God. When God calls Samuel, the, Samuel's a boy, God calls out to him, the Lord called Samuel, he says, here I am, ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called. Eli says, it wasn't me, go lay down again. God calls again. 
Down and down again. And then he calls the third time. And it's only after three calls that the priest Eli realizes this is the divine Lord talking to you. When Abraham is called to covenant with God, God tells him to bring two birds. You can't really date birds, but you can date livestock. And three items of his livestock. He says, bring me a heifer, three years old, female goat, three years old, and a ram, three years old. The sacredness of three. When uh, um, Elijah is battling out at Mount Carmel with Baal's prophets, and Baal's prophets are futile, what does Elijah do? He says, fill four jars with water. We'll talk about four in a minute. Pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood, then do it a second time, and then do it a third time. And it's only after the third time it works. By the way, when Elijah tells his servant to go out to, to on the mountaintop and look out to the sea for the sign that the, the, the drought is ending and the rain clouds are coming, go out. We'll see that again in a minute. And you'll look at the numbers there. Jonah in the whale. How long does God designate for him to stay in the whale? Three days and three nights. Balaam, who gives his oracle, excuse me, who gives his oracle to Israel. How many times does he bless them to get their full blessing? Three times. So three is this number of uh, completion. But it's a holy, sacred number. If we go back, please. Now, let's talk about a second number that we're going to see a lot. We're going to see the number four repeatedly. By the way, three was not just sacred to the Israelites. Three was a sacred number in all of the cultures back then. With the pantheon of gods that the Babylonians had. They had three great gods, and they always put those three great gods together. They lived together. That's not a trinity. They also fought each other. They were distinct gods. But three is used repeatedly for divine matters, uh, uh, including magical incantations and things of that nature. So uh, uh, you've got those references in your text. I'd rather stick with Scripture because we're going to run out of time for even this part of the lesson. So I want to talk to you next about the number four. Now, if three is a total number referencing divine activity or the sacred, four is the total number that represents the completeness of the world. So you've got divine with three. You've got the world with four. These, some of these are gimmies. But let's look at a few real quick. We'll spend just a few minutes on it because we are running slow on time. Um, a river flows out of Eden. To water the garden, it divides, becomes four rivers. So it's four rivers that encompass the promised land for God. Um, God, Isaiah, says that God will raise a signal for the nations and assemble the banished of Israel and gather them from the four corners of the earth. That doesn't mean that the ones in the center don't count. That doesn't mean that the ones that are northeast or northwest or southeast or southwest don't count. You're either dead north, south, east, or west, or you don't get to come. The four corners is the complete and total earth. And that's what it's talking about there. Uh, we see it again in Ezekiel. In Ezekiel, when Ezekiel talks about, he says, the end has come upon the four corners of the land. That means the entirety of the land, not simply four corners. Four means the completeness. When Peter is, uh, 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 has the vision that it's okay to eat any food of the earth, that vision is produced by a sheet that comes down from four corners with all of the animals in it to represent the totality. It's not simply the animals he saw that he was allowed to eat. It was all of them. And that's not just in Acts 10, but even when Peter recounts the story in Acts 11, you see it again there. Now, you see it in some other places where God tells Abraham that uh, his people are going to sojourn or live in a foreign land, he says it will happen for 400 years. Now, that, you say, well, that's not four, that's 400. That's four times 100. That's four in the Hebrew 100s. They're going to be, now, does that mean that it wasn't exactly 400 years? Well, I don't know if it was 400 to the day. We don't have any way of knowing. But God's letting them know that that's the time period. It will be the complete and full time period until the time is ripe for them to come out. 
um, you know, God brings judgment on Elam, and he brings that judgment from the four quarters of heaven and the four winds. That means God's coming in full judgment. The valley of dry bones. God tells Ezekiel in the valley of dry bones to prophesy to the breath, to the wind, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. When Daniel has the vision, we'll talk about in depth, God willing, next week. This is a vision. And in his vision, he sees four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea and four beasts come out of the sea. And there's something to be said that these are specific beasts, that these are specific kingdoms. And we can look at them historically and see that. But there's a broader message too. There's a message that this applies to all the kingdoms of man and all the kingdoms of earth because there is not a kingdom that God does not sovereignly reign over and God does not sovereignly judge. And so we got to get that thrust of it. Well, you see it again in Zechariah. In Zechariah, there are four horsemen that God sends out to the four angels. And, he, and, and uh, um, God lifts his eyes, there, or uh, Zechariah does, and sees four horns. And he says, these are the horns that have scattered Judah. And the Lord showed me four craftsmen who were going to take care of the horns. And the whole picture image here is that all of the people who have judged Israel harshly, God will send out whomever he needs to take care of it. Because four is this. Um, we see four in Revelation multiple times. We'll deal with that as well. So that's four. I'm going to move a little quicker. Number seven. Seven represented totality and perfection. And the, the, this is not just in Israel. It's in the cultures around it. It goes back to the Gudea. There are some Gudea documents that date 2000 B.C. that show seven as this idea of totality and perfection. In the Bible, um, it's so thick, I won't go through all of it on the overhead. Let me just go through it like this with you. How many days of the week? How many days of creation? Seven. Total and perfect. And it's on that day seven that God says, now it's total, now it's perfect, now I will rest. Cain says, oh no, now I'm going to get killed because God, you've put a curse on me. And God says to Cain, not so. Oh, this is too good not to put up here. All right, I'm sorry. It is, it's just look at this because this, there's a real picture here. God, the Lord says to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. Well, does that mean that they're going to go to the death penalty chair seven times? We're going we're gonna to electrocute you. Then we're going to lethally inject you. Then we're going to hang you. Then we're going to put you in front of a firing squad. Then we're, I mean, is, is it sevenfold? No, he just means totally, completely. And the interesting thing is, when seven is not deemed to be full enough to old writers, they'll do seven times seven, which you get in the very next chapter, where, where uh, 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 Lamech is worried about what he's done, and he says to his wives, if Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's revenge is seventy-sevenfold. Sevenfold, seventy times. You just when you thought it was totally and perfectly there, it's more. God tells Noah, take seven pairs of clean animals to the ark. The ark rests on the seventh day. He, Noah sends out a dove. Dove doesn't return. Seven days later, sends out another dove. Um, Jacob served seven years for Rachel. Seven years for Leah. When Jacob goes to see and sees his brother Esau and he's scared to death, Esau's mad and Esau's going to kill him. What does Jacob do? He bows seven times. Say, I want to totally and perfectly show that I am your servant. Pharaoh's dream that God gives him. Seven cows of plenty, fat ones, seven skinny ones, eat them. Seven fat ears of corn, seven dry ears of corn. Representing seven years, the totality of what God was doing. The perfect number. Um, Joseph goes and mourns his father for seven days after his father dies. Uh, the law is about slaves. Seventh year if you're a Hebrew, your year to be released. Seven is used throughout all of the calendar events of Israel. Seven is used for the times that the priests would sprinkle the blood seven times in the sacrifices. He'd have to do it seven times. 
seven times represents totality, represents perfection. Jericho, how many days did they march around the wall? Seven days. And on the seventh day, how many priests? Seven priests. With how many horns? Seven horns. How many times around? Seven times around. And then the wall came tumbling down. Midian oppresses Israel. Seven years God uh, allows it. Seven times. Um, I, it just goes on and on and on. Oh, Saul and Samuel. Great story. Samuel says, you stay there for seven days and I'll come and then we'll sacrifice. You stay there until the time is right is what Samuel means. Saul takes it as a literal seven days. And when Samuel's not there by seven days, he says, well, I better do it myself. And establishes his own totality and perfection rather than God's. And that's what cost him. Um, I told you about Elijah sending his man to the sea to see when the hand of God was bringing. It's the seventh time he climbs that mountain to look out that he sees the clouds coming. Uh, Naaman dips in the Jordan seven times. Look at a passage like this. This is a good one where it shows it's being used only in the symbolic manner and not in a numerical manner. The righteous falls seven times and rises again. Now that does, this is a proverb, that doesn't mean that the righteous people, oh, I've fallen my seventh time, whew, I'm glad I got that out of the way. I hope to have a few more decades to live and I'll never have to fall again. No, it's, it's, it's like the evil person who has seven abominations in his heart. Don't count them. That's not talking about the number seven. Um, I've left out the number ten. Let's go to, oh, seven. The Revelation is written to the seven churches. Well, that's a real seven churches. But it's written to all of the churches of all time. Because those seven are symbolic. Let's look at the number ten. Ten was a round number of indefinite magnitude. What do we mean by that? That's like gajillions today. Okay, I mean, it's just like, it, and, and so, you know, when God says, uh, I mean, when, when Jacob says to his wife, says, you know, Laban cheated me ten times out of my wages. He just means, he cheated me all the time. That'd be like us saying, he cheated me gajillions of times. When God says, ten times you didn't obey my voice, do you honestly think out of all of those Israelites, it only happened ten times that they didn't obey the voice of God? It happened all the time. Here's a good example of how it so clearly means that, and then we'll look at some points for home. Look at this passage in Deuteronomy. This is Deuteronomy 22, and it's talking about who's excluded from the assembly of God. It says, No Ammonite or Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. Even to the tenth generation. Now, if I'm telling you tenth means innumerable, what do you think that means? It means they're never getting in there, doesn't it? Okay? Nehemiah reads this 800 years later. Nehemiah 13, here's the way Nehemiah understood it. On the first day they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and in it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God. And doesn't say can't enter it to the tenth generation. It says they never can because that's what that tenth meant. That's what the tenth meant. Um, let's look at the points for home. I have left out the fact, by the way. This is, all right, just a little tease here. This is apocalyptic literature. This is a very special kind of writing when we get to Daniel that we'll talk about next week. It's apocalypsis is the Greek word. It means an uncovering. It, apo means to, away from. Uh, calypsis is a, a covering or a veil. So it's taking the veil off. It's an uncovering. That's the kind of literature. And there is another book in the Bible that's really loaded with that. Anybody know what it is? Of course, it's Revelation. In fact, that's the first word in the book of Revelation, apocalypsis, the revelation or the uncovering, because this is a, a, a type of writing that uncovers the future, 
But it's also a type of writing that itself has to be uncovered because it's so hard to understand. So we'll talk about how it's visions of the future, that there's an intermediary who helps you understand it, that there are symbols used prolifically, and that it talks about end times oftentimes. And so we'll get into all of that later. We don't have time to today, but it's still part of the mindset and culture that we'll see when we look at Daniel chapter 7. Now, your points for home. Do you remember what 7 is? I mean, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I'm not denying that there is a legitimate number 7. I'm not out to run a pharmaceutical company where 7 and 1 are the same thing, or 6 and 1. But 7 symbolizes totality, God's totality, God's perfection. Now, if someone sins against me, should I forgive them all the time? Should I forgive them seven times? Jesus says, not just all the time, but when you think you've forgiven them all the time, you forgive them more. Seventy times seven. Seven times ten, which is innumerable forever, gajillions. Seventy-seven times. Total, total, total. Forgiveness. Ten. Ten represents the innumerable amount. Ten's everything, right? The tenth generation means never are the Ammonites allowed in the temple. God says every tithe, and that word tithe is the Hebrew word for tenth. That's why your tithe is ten percent. <laughs> It's what it means. You can't say, I tithe 5%. That means, I 10%, 5%. Okay. Tithe means 10%. Every tithe of the land is the Lord's. It's holy to the Lord's. You tithe to the Lord because you give that 10%, but what does it represent? Everything. That all we have is God's. Everything. It really is God's. And then our last point for home is the Aaron's benediction. If three is the fullness and the beauty of the sacred God. By the way, three is the sacred full number. Four is the earthly full number. Philo of Alexandria, who lived at the time of Jesus and Paul, said that's why seven is such a wonderful number. It's three plus four. It's everything that's spiritual and everything that's physical all put together. Which is also why 12 is such, has the same significance as, as 7. You have 12 months of the year, not by happenstance. So anyway, last point for home, the threefold benediction. And it's my prayer that the Lord would bless you and keep you. And God would make his face shine upon you, his countenance upon you, that he would give you peace. Would you pray with me? Lord, it thrills me to get to see the way you spoke. To understand just a glimmer more of some depths and richness that's in your word waiting for us to grow into it. And it's my prayer that we'll do so with hearts that are pure before you. That seek really, not grand knowledge, not hearts that seek uh, to know more for knowledge's sake. Lord, we just want to love you better and appreciate you more and see you reign deeper and deeper in our hearts and in our lives to see your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.